humbling as it is, the gut is actually where all of this is happening. And Hippocrates said it best 2,500 years ago that all disease begins in the gut. And the guy was right. What are the daily foods that people eat that harm them and why they need to cut out each of those foods? What are some of like the big no-nos in your eyes? Oh, wow. Where to, where to start? Well, um, the, the foods that people are eating uh, have been so adulterated that they're unrecognizable. And actually, one of the things that bothers me the most is the idea that you know, whole grains, whole grain goodness is somehow equated with good health. <laughs> and believe it or not, uh, the idea of having grains whole is, is really a very modern concept. Um, when, when I was growing up, uh, we had, of course, Wonder Bread, and we ate a lot of white bread and white pasta and white stuff. And nobody ever considered uh, putting wheat germ on anything except a few hippies. Uh, and it turns out that there were reasons why cultures like the Italians, like the French, uh, got rid of the wholeness in whole grain. Hmm. And uh, because these contain, as you know, and I know, and hopefully your listeners know, some little nasty plant proteins that are called lectins. And lectins uh, are one of the best ways I have ever found for causing leaky gut. And uh, this was among other things proven by uh, Dr. Alessio Fasano, who's now at Harvard. Who, who showed, uh, particularly in the case of gluten, which is a lectin, that gluten is really good at uh, causing leaky gut or intestinal permeability. And why anybody would want intestinal permeability, uh, particularly if they want to be a genius going on later in life, um, is, is beyond my comprehension. I'll start there. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, isn't the isn't the opposite of whole grains refined grains, though? Like if we're if we're not eating whole grains, does that mean we're supposed to eat refined grains? No, uh, because gluten is actually um, not removed by refining. It is actually more concentrated. But there's some real mischief makers in the halls of grains. Mm. For instance, wheat germ of gluten, uh, which is a little tiny lectin that can get through the wall of our gut uh, without leaky gut, is in the hall of, uh, of wheat, rye, and barley. So, but your point is well taken. Uh, when cultures, uh, let's use the Italians, for example, uh, do use refined flour to make pasta, one of the things they do with pasta, and I spend a lot of time studying over there, is they undercook their pasta, number one, and that makes it much more difficult difficult and slow to digest into simple sugars. The other thing that strikes me with a number of my patients with autoimmune diseases, who when we do testing uh, for the causes of their leaky gut, almost, almost every one of them has antibodies to the various uh, parts of wheat, including wheat germ gluten and gluten uh, and non-wheat proteins. And over the course of a year of uh, treating them and sealing their leaky gut, uh, about 95% of these people actually lose all of their antibodies to the various components of wheat. They forget their immune system is actually retrained. But what happens to a lot of these people is they'll go over to Italy, or they'll go over to France and they'll have the croissant, they'll have the pizza, and they don't react. They, they don't flare their psoriasis. They don't feel pain in their joints. Um, their gut doesn't bother them. And they, they come back and they say, this is great. You know, I'm cured. I now can tolerate all these foods that Dr. Gundry, you know, forbade. And they start eating our bread and our pizza. And within either a day or a week, 
um, their psoriasis flares or rheumatoid arthritis back and they go, what the heck? You know, I thought I was cured. And I think that's the second point that uh, you know and I know that most of our food has been tainted by glyphosate Roundup. And I wrote about this in the last book, The Energy Paradox. Um, Glyphosate in and of itself is really good at causing leaky gut. Uh, without any other help from anything else. And people sadly don't know that almost all of our food is contaminated with Roundup. And we, we associate Roundup with GMO foods, but in fact, now Roundup is sprayed as a desiccant to kill fields and make them ready for harvest on a scheduled basis. So almost all of our wheat, almost all of our corn, almost all of our soybeans, canola, um, you name it, oats is sprayed with Roundup uh, to make it harvestable. Mm -hmm. Um, And so, uh, you know, it's in our California wines. Um, it's, It's everywhere. And so we're just awash with it. And so when somebody goes over to Europe, where it's far less common and where it's being banned now repeatedly, um, they're eating, you know, pasta or breads that um, are far less worrisome because they're not contaminated with glyphosate. And that's over the last, I don't know, 10 years, that's been a real eye opener for me is the difference in, in what are seemingly identical foods, but they're grown here versus grown over there. That is fascinating. What are some other general, oh, this is so helpful. What are some other general guidelines that you could offer uh, for us to avoid, or at least to minimize our exposure to, to glyphosate? So, you know, if at all possible, buy organic or even biodynamic uh, wines. Uh, it's easier to find now. We're beginning to um, have biodynamic uh, growers uh, in California. I know several winemakers in the Santa Barbara area who are now biodynamic and organic. Uh, In general, Europe is way ahead of us in biodynamic and organic uh, wineries. A lot of the French wines, a lot of the Italian wines are organic now. A lot of the Austrian wines are organic. So if in doubt, I hate to say this, you know, buy buy French or Italian or, or, or Australian wines. So that's one way. Sadly, even organic may not be glyphosate free. And I'll give you an example. Um, There's a a winemaker in Santa Barbara County, Beckman Vineyards, and the Beckmans are a biodynamic uh, vineyard and have been for a number of years. And I've talked to him and there's this patch of vines uh, that and he said, well, wait a minute, that doesn't say it's biodynamic. He says, yeah, that's because it abuts our neighbor and our neighbor sprays with glyphosate and it drifts. And so we can't get it certified. Um, and, and so there's a lot of organic oat products that have actually been, um, you know, organic, but in fact, they uh, have had drift on them. Plus, you you probably know there was a a huge um, controversy that I think the New York Times found that there was a a gentleman who will go on name that was buying up uh, organic farms for producing organic wheat and organic corn. And there were small plots. And then he was buying up industrial farms. And he got his certification for these small plots and he applied his certification to all of the normal plots that were being sprayed with Roundup and glyphosate. Mm. And and it wasn't until recently that he was actually caught. And so almost everything that he was selling as organic was conventionally farmed. Wow. Fascinating. (laughs) Fascinating. Um, so, okay. We talked about whole grains. I just have to ask brown rice or white rice, just oh, white rice, white rice. Yeah. Brown rice is 
I can't tell you the number of people with autoimmune diseases that I see that brown rice is one of their biggest culprits. And when we switch them over to white basmati rice or even pressure cooked rice, um, that's the problem starts resolving right away. You also get uh, the, there's the potential for exposure to arsenic in brown Very rice. Very true. Very true. Yeah. Wow. Fascinating. OK, so. we yeah. Bummer. Because we've been told for decades, right? Like to, right. to like if it's if it's brown, like avoid the white carbs. Right. Right. I feel but like I, that's that's still something that's echoed amongst some in the nutritional orthodoxy. Right. Avoid the white carbs. Yeah. But, I, you know, I think the other thing that is is sad is that labeling laws have been made to hide the actual sugar danger in products. And I, I actually had the former head of the FDA, um, Dr. Kessler on the Dr. Gundry podcast a while back. And he was actually in charge of the labeling law, the labeling on the back of a package. And he, as he tells the story, he gets a call from uh, President Reagan to, to get over to the Oval Office. There has to be a meeting. And there in the Oval Office are representatives of big agriculture. And I won't, won't name the names, but they're all there. And they basically said, you can't put this information on a label. And he said, what are you talking about? You know, it's, uh, I'm telling people how much sugar is in there. They said, no, you, you can't tell people how much sugar is in this product. They'll never buy it. And he said, but, the, but that's how much sugar is in there. And they said, well, you're going to have to disguise it. You're going to have to put it someplace else that they won't see it. And so they agreed that if there were two sugar molecules bound together with a chemical bond, you no longer had to call it sugar. You could call it a complex carbohydrate. Mm. Mm. So, and he uses the example of a bagel, which was great. And he says, okay, we've got a bagel, it's 300 calories. And you look down and it says zero sugar or one gram of sugar. And you go, oh, great. Uh, and then you look at, total carbohydrates and it's like you know 40 grams of of total carbohydrates and but no sugar well and as i write in my books what you got to do is you got to take the total carbohydrates and you got to subtract the fiber which we don't digest and let's suppose there's two grams of fiber so there's now 38 grams of sugar in that bagel not one gram of sugar. And just for people to grasp what that is, there's four grams of sugar in a teaspoon. So in that bagel, it, it, he, and he does the math, there's like 10 teaspoons of sugar in that healthy sugar-free bagel. And, and people go, well, I don't taste the sugar. And you're right. It, it's, you know, it's well hidden, but uh, I'll give you an example from actually yesterday with a patient. I had a patient who's He's a, he's a pre-diabetic and I've got him on, you know, what I think is my uh, ketogenic diet and his triglycerides are high and he's got insulin resistance and I'm going, you're eating a ton of sugar. He said, Oh no, I don't eat any sugar. Mm. And I, he said, no, it's, it's out of my diet. I, you know, I eat no candy, I eat no desserts. And I said, okay. Uh, what, what'd you have for breakfast this morning? And he says, Oh, I had sugar-free rice checks. And I go, sugar-free rice checks? He <laughs> says, yeah, you know, it's got the heart healthy seal on it. And I said, oh, I tell you what, let's pull up the box of rice checks. And I pull it up on the phone. And sure enough, there's, you know, one gram of sugar and 44 grams of carbohydrate. And actually, no fiber. So this guy's having 11 teaspoons in his bowl of sugar-free rice checks and is wondering, you know, he's eating sugar-free and he's wondering why he's still a diabetic and he's got high insulin levels and he's not losing weight. It's because we've been fooled. <laughs> and the glucose molecules begin to break apart before you even swallow Right? Oh, yeah. You know, I mean, white bread has a glycemic index of 100. It's the perfect glucose delivery device that's ever been invented. 
Wow. So we're talking <laughs> we're talking about grains, but I'm assuming that the next food that you might uh, urge our our viewers to steer and our listeners to steer clear from is sugar. True. We uh, we are awash in sugar, and unfortunately, sugar is also well hidden with other names, um, like you know, like pure cane sugar. Somehow that's better. Um, high fructose corn syrup. Um, normally, and people somehow don't associate that sugar table sugar is sucrose, and it's half glucose and half fructose. High fructose corn syrup usually is about 55% fructose uh, and 45% glucose, but it can be manipulated higher. Uh, Fructose in and of itself has a much sweeter taste than glucose. And um, uh, my good friend David Plumrider and I uh, have, have been on our horse for a long time to please have people recognize how much fructose is hidden in so many of our prepared foods. Uh, And fructose is actually the the evil sugar. Uh, Tell you a fascinating story years ago, when I was kind of first getting into this, a a major nutraceutical company that made a lot of protein drinks and protein powders wanted to have me consult with them and be an advisor and wonderful people. Uh, And almost every one of their weight loss shakes and protein powders had fructose as the main ingredient. And I go, well, geez, this is a non-starter. You know, this, this is stuff is poison. They said, what are you talking about? Fructose is great because it doesn't raise insulin, and <laughs> and that's why it's there. And you know, it's 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 a miracle. And I, I'm, and this was oh boy, almost twenty years ago. And we to this day, people still think of fructose uh, and and fruit as you know as somehow really healthy, without realizing that. Number one, fructose is hiding everywhere these days, particularly in high fructose corn syrup. But even our fruit has been bred for sugar content. Um, There's now in an an apple, there's more sugar than a whole Hershey's candy bar. Wow. Yeah. And when I was growing up, you know, back in the dark ages, uh, an apple was the size of kind of a pixie tangerine. And now an apple, of course, is the size of a grapefruit. And, and the names give it away, you know, like honey crisp or <laughs> ambrosia. And these things just did not exist. Uh, for fun, for one of my podcasts, I I bought a little bag of mini apples that were at Bristol Farms, Whole Foods, and then bought a, a regular apple right next to it, an organic one. And you could actually, and mini apples was what we ate when I was a kid. And you could get, I put it together, there were about six mini apples that occupied the space of the current single apple. And quite frankly, an apple a day might have kept the doctor away 50 years ago, but an apple a day now is a really good way to increase your sugar load without knowing it. No, oh, Dr. G, don't take my honey crisp apples away from me. I, See, I, lo- I knew it. I knew it. <laughs> I love them too much. I love them too much. So one thing that you all, we're, we're talking about fructose and one thing that you often see fructose marketed as, as being diabetic friendly. But you're what I, what I think that you're you've alluded to is that this is completely uh, misguided. Is that is that accurate? Yes, that's correct. Uh, in fact, in my last book, The Energy Paradox, I really spent a long time debunking the myth that fruit fructose is diabetic friendly. In fact, it's really good at producing diabetes and insulin resistant. Mm. Fructose is a mitochondrial poison. And it is such a poison that it is taken directly to the liver. Do not pass go, do not collect $200, do not get into the bloodstream, where it's detoxified into triglycerides, fat, and uric acid. 
And as you and I both know, uric acid is pretty bad for everything. It's great for raising blood pressure. It's great for killing kidneys. It's great for causing gout. And it's actually great for storing fat. Uh, in fact, um, great apes only gain weight during fruit season and fruit does not ripen year round in the jungle. It ripens on a seasonal basis. So uh, as I show in the energy paradox, fructose actually is one of the biggest causes in and of itself for insulin resistance and for actually stopping mitochondrial energy production. Uh, it's really good for gaining weight. Uh, and as anyone knows, one of the best ways to gain weight is to raise your insulin level. And insulin is the fat storage hormone. So anyhow. Yeah. And fructose, as you mentioned, high fructose corn syrup is in actuality only about 55% fructose. Right. Uh, table sugar is about 50% fructose. Agave syrup is something that that you see a lot of health minded individuals reach for instead of cane sugar. But agave syrup, as I understand it, is actually among the highest in fructose concentration in the supermarket. Correct. And agave, yeah, agave gets, you know, oh, it's healthy and, you know, it's it's fructose and that's safe. There is agave inulin. And people hear agave inulin, and inulin happens to be this wonderful prebiotic fiber that we cannot digest, we cannot absorb inulin, and it feeds good gut buddies. And I can't tell you the number of people who write to me and they say, you're telling people to have agave. And I thought, I'm not telling people to have agave. I'm telling people to avoid agave. They say, oh, no, agave inulin. I said, no, that's totally different. Yeah, stay away from agave syrup. It's just pure fructose. Yeah. Speaking of gut, uh, our gut buddies, um, what are some other ways that we can keep them happy? Because I know that this plays a large role um, in terms of keeping our immune systems healthy and robust, play, uh, plays a large role in, um, in, in, in regulating levels of inflammation in our bodies, among other things. So talk to me about, talk to me about that, the gut, our gut buddies, the microbiome. Well, I talk about, you know, your area of interest. Uh, we're, we're learning literally with every passing day that if we want to have good brain health, um, it's dependent on us having good uh, gut health and good gut buddies. Uh, more and more, we're realizing that most of the brain uh, protecting compounds uh, are actually coming from our microbiome. And, you know, who would have guessed um, before 12 years ago that our brain had anything to do with our gut? The only people who knew uh, were actually women. Uh, women have known forever. They have a gut feeling and guys are, you know, we have no gut sense of anything. <laughs> Uh, and they were they were right about this. And as you know, from from your research, uh, what goes on in our gut is really going to affect, well, every organ system, but particularly our brain. Um, I was talking with um, David Perlmutter off camera and I said, you know, it's really funny. Um, you're a neurologist and I'm a heart surgeon cardiologist. And. The fact is, all you and I talk about is the gut and mm. the microbiome. I said, isn't that hilarious that, you know, we've all converged from our various specialties down in the gut where, you know, none of us would even thought of being interested in it. And he says, yeah, you know, Hippocrates was right. You know, 2,500 years ago, all disease begins in the gut. And the guy was right. And he didn't have our sophisticated tests. Why keto? And what role can it play in helping us live longer and live healthier? Yeah, you know, uh, secretly in this uh, Unlocking the Keto Code book is uh, probably Longevity Paradox 2.0. It's actually a longevity book hiding in a keto book. And I think that's actually very useful information because <laughs> I think most people don't necessarily think of keto as a, as a longevity program, but in fact, uh, the things that we can learn from the effects of ketones uh, on 
our mitochondria is uh, is pretty useful information uh, going forward if you like you and me if we want to uh, die young at a ripe old age uh, I've yeah absolutely um so why well first off i guess off the top one thing that really surprised me when reading the book is that you call ketones in fact i believe it's one of the titles of, of uh it's the title of one of your chapters uh, a, a poor fuel source yep so that i mean just off the off the bat that's kind of a surprising headline to read in a book that is all about apparently espousing the benefits of of a keto diet right so unpack that for me well you know i among others have advocated a ketogenic version of my diet in in all my books and uh, i was a big keto fan and i kind of like everybody else said well, you know, ketones make you an efficient fat burner, et cetera, et cetera. And that's how you lose weight. But when I was writing The Energy Paradox, my last book, uh, I like to back up my claims with research and document it. So I'm kind of working on where ketones fit into energy production. And so I decided to, uh, you know, go way back in time and look at all the original uh, ketone research that was done at Harvard and the NIH uh, by George Cahill and his uh, student, uh, Dr. Owens, and by Dr. Veach at the NIH. And lo and behold, uh, it turns out that even though Dr. Veach uh, became famous for saying our natural state should be starvation and that ketones are the most magnificent, perfect fuel, um, particularly Dr. Cahill's work and Dr. Owen's work at Harvard said, well, actually not so fast. When they looked at uh, humans that were in starvation and producing ketones, they found that interestingly enough, after about three days of not eating, muscles uh, preferred ketones as a fuel. But immediately after that, they shift over to burning free fatty acids as their preferred fuel. And if you look at uh, ketosis for any length of time, it turns out that even at full ketosis, uh, only 30% of the uh, calorie energy needs for the body can be met by using ketones. And the rest have to come from free fatty acids and proteins and some glucose. Even the brain, at full ketosis, uh, only gets 60 to 70% of its needs met by ketones, and the rest has to come from glucose. So if this was a perfect fuel, why would human studies suggest that maybe it isn't? In fact, when you compare that with um, uh, um, Vogel's and Finney's work in ketogenic diet for athletes, they point out that it takes three to four weeks to become keto adapted to a ketogenic diet. And yet from Cahill's work, at three days, muscles prefer ketones as their fuel source. So one would think that if ketones were that good and the muscles were using them fully at three weeks, at, at three days, why would it take three or four weeks to become keto adapted? And they themselves admit that exercise performance drops and drops pretty dramatically for three to four weeks. So something's wrong with ketones are a great fuel. And yet I and, and others, pra I, you know, I come to praise ketones, but I need to bury them as a great fuel source. And we need to find out, okay, if they're not a great fuel source, why do they exist? And why are there benefits of getting ketones generated. And that's the purpose of the book. I love that. Well, I really do want to do a deep dive into uh, the benefits that you've identified in your research. But let's like let's take a step back, I think, because there are probably some listeners um, and viewers of this who are either A, unfamiliar with ketones and what the ketogenic diet is, or could perhaps benefit from a, a refresher, a, a crash course, if you will. So what is the ketogenic diet? Um, and of course, what are, what are ketones within the context of, uh, of the ketogenic diet? 
Sure. Uh, ketones have been known about since the late 1800s. They were discovered in Germany and they were detected actually in people uh, with type 1 diabetes. And nobody really knew what to think about them. They really were not viewed as a fuel source. Uh, they were viewed maybe as a toxic byproduct. But the real interest in the ketogenic diet started in 1930 when it was learned that children with seizure disorders who had severe seizure disorders uh, spent a lot of time post ictal, uh, you know, recovering from a seizure and they weren't eating very much. In fact, they were starving. And researchers noted, particularly in Boston at the Mayo Clinic, that these children who were starving, when they were starving, uh, they weren't having any seizures or their seizures dramatically decreased. Now, starving children as a treatment for epilepsy is not a good idea. It's a hard sell. That's a hard sell. <laughs> but the Mayo Clinic said, gee, uh, when you're starving, you're making ketones. And the only other way to make ketones, and we'll get to what they are in a second, is to basically not eat, eat any carbohydrates or proteins and just basically eat fat. So they made a diet of 80% fat. 10% carbohydrates and 10% proteins and actually coined the phrase ketogenic diet. And they fed it to these kids with epilepsy. And lo and behold, these kids had dramatic reduction in their seizures. In fact, it was the standard of care for many years for childhood epilepsy. And this was before drugs like phenobarbital or um, dilantin came about. Now, when dilantin and phenobarb came out, the ketogenic diet uh, kind of went by the wayside, but these uh, these drugs were still not perfect. And the ketogenic diet had uh, a resurgence in actually the 80s and 90s and using a totally different fat called MCT, medium chain triglycerides. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But back to ketones. What we now know is that normally, if we all have metabolic flexibility, and that basically means the ability for our mitochondria to either use glucose as a fuel or to use free fatty acids as a fuel to generate ATP, and they can usually switch on a dime. The minute glucose runs out, you start uh, releasing free fatty acids from fat cells and you burn free fatty acids. And that's great. Only one problem. Free fatty acids are large fat soluble molecules. And as you know, they do not get through the blood brain barrier. They technically can, but it's such a slow process and the brain is such an energy hog that they just can't supply the brain with enough fuel. So enter ketones. Luckily, ketones are generated by the liver from free fatty acids. And interestingly enough, the liver can't use ketones. And I point out in the book that one famous ketone author says the liver loves ketones. Uh, no, sorry, the liver can't use ketones. So the liver throws it out into circulation. Ketone bodies are short chain fatty acids that are water soluble. And so they have the ability to get through the brain when glucose is no longer available. So they basically act as a temporary support system for the brain and keep the brain alive, waiting for the next time you eat. Uh, and this was a brilliant survival mechanism. Uh, obviously, every evidence is that our hunter-gatherers went through periods of feast and periods of famine. And one of the benefits of being what we call the fat ape, uh, we're the only ape that has huge fat stores, is that we could make it through long periods of not eating or minimal eating because we could live on our fat and we could keep our brain going pretty doggone well using ketones as an alternative fuel for glucose. So um, that's where the idea of, you know, where ketones come from and why ketones are actually pretty doggone important for survival mechanisms. 
Fast forward, the ketogenic diet said, gee, when people are in this ketosis, um, one of the consequences seems to be weight loss. And it must be because you become an efficient fat burner. And you're so efficient at burning fat that you prefer burning fat. And that's why you lose weight. Uh, unfortunately, uh, that's not the reason you lose weight. And that's one of the big shockers in the book. It really has nothing to do with being an efficient fat burner. It has the opposite. Uh, you become actually an incredibly wasteful burner of fat. You actually waste fat, and that's actually why you lose weight. You waste fat when you are fat adapted, when you're keto adapted? Correct. That is fascinating. So is it is it safe to say that your average American is never in ketosis, never, Correct. never experience ex experiences exposure to ketones. Yeah, here, that's the, the bad news. Um, most, most, well, half of normal weight Americans have no metabolic flexibility. I mean, think about that for a minute. So half of us walking around with a normal weight, you and me, cannot shift to burning fat as a fuel. 50%. Now, overweight Americans, 88% of overweight Americans cannot, or they're metabolically inflexible, can't make the shift. And 99.5% of obese individuals are metabolically inflexible. They cannot make the shift. And you go, holy cow, uh, overweight and obese, that's most Americans. So most Americans can't make this shift. And that's why uh, one of the patients I profile in the book, Miranda, uh, Miranda uh, was on a ketogenic diet uh, guided by her physician for two years. And she couldn't lose weight, number one, and she actually gained weight. She gained 15 pounds during that two years. And when I saw her, we actually look at fasting free fatty acids and ketone bodies in our patients. And she wasn't in ketosis, number one. And shockingly, she had an insulin level of 16, uh, which meant she was insulin resistant. And she was apoplectic. She said, well, that's ridiculous. You know, I've been on a ketogenic diet for two years. And I said, well, guess what? You've probably never been in ketosis. And, you know, and here's why. And that's how we went into this for her. And luckily, once she understood why it wasn't working for her, she's actually done great once we changed things around. So not only does a ketogenic diet not necessarily guarantee weight loss, but you can actually gain weight on a ketogenic diet. This is, we're blowing the lid, I think, on a massive misconception that many people have that ketogenic diets equal weight loss. Correct. Yeah, you know, here's, here's the deal. So if you were really, if a ketogenic diet made you an efficient fat burner, think about what that means. Efficiency means actually getting the most out of something. Uh, let's use gasoline as an equivalent for fat. If I wanted to be an efficient gasoline burner, I would buy a Toyota Prius. Very efficient at getting 50 miles out of a gallon of gas. On the other hand, if I wanted to be an inefficient fat burner, gas burner, I'd buy a Ferrari. Uh, really good at wasting gas. Now, there might be other reasons that you and I might want a Ferrari, but for the analogy, it's a really great way to to waste gas. So here's the problem. As you know, and I know, fats have nine uh, calories per gram, carbohydrates and proteins only four. So it's got literally more than twice the amount of calories per gram as sugar and protein fats. So if I'm an efficient fat burner and I'm eating mostly fat, I should actually get fat. I should gain weight because I'm really efficient at using that fat. And of course, the opposite is true. If you're actually getting the benefits that ketones were actually designed to do, and that's to 
paradoxically, love that word, should use it in a book sometime. <laughs> uh, paradoxically, you actually are wasting fat. You become an inefficient fat burner. You become, a, you turn your mitochondria into Ferraris. And that actually may be very fan, beneficial to turn your mitochondria into Ferraris. So is it that eating more fat makes you burn more fat? Not necessarily so. And as I talk about in the books, there are not, fats are not fats. And there are lots of different fats with lots of different effects on mitochondria and the ability to get into ketone and get into ketosis. And I show in, in, in a nerdy sort of way in one chapter that fats are not fats. And you got to choose your fats carefully if you really want to get the benefits of, of a high fat diet. But the good news is you really don't have to follow a high fat diet to get into ketosis. And that's actually the exciting news. Because quite frankly, uh, studies of humans show that 60% of people who embark on a ketogenic diet quit within a month. And there are multiple reasons for that. First of all, it's profoundly boring to eat, you know, a pound of cream cheese sprinkled with cheddar cheese with a bacon chaser um, constantly. Mm -hmm. um, as I point out, some researchers from the University of Sydney in Australia have shown in animals and humans that all animals, including humans, have carbohydrate sensors. And that we have a need to sense those presence of carbohydrates. And we will fight against all odds to find carbohydrates, even on you know, a ketogenic diet. And I think that's one of the reasons why so many people on a ketogenic diet who even are doing well go, ah, you know, if if I don't, if I don't have a piece of sourdough bread uh, right now, you know, I'm going to kill somebody. And uh, I think we can all relate to that. It's, I, I spent my career trying to devise a program that people can live with literally and figuratively. And, you know, the evidence is that it's very difficult to live uh, on a ketogenic diet long-term. Nor should yeah, go ahead. Yeah, it's a, it's a very difficult uh, diet to to sustain, and that's why I think it's good to um, to share with people that you know the, the ketogenic diet that they see promoted by their favorite Instagram guru is not something a that they even need to get the body of their dreams, right? But that actually could be um, posing them unnecessary health risks, right? Correct. There's a, and you, you kind of touched on this, but there's, there's colloquially, I mean, these are not scientific terms, but dirty keto and clean keto. You know, sometimes people will, uh, they'll base their diet around blocks of cheese and butter. And, um, I see some of these meals that people post on social media and they look, I mean, they look horrific from a, from a, from the standpoint of you, from your vantage point, a cardiologist, <laughs> I mean, you must be, uh, livid when you see or not livid but um some of these some of these like the ways that people practice ketogenic diets must be really um shocking to you well you know here's the news you know i i look at my patient's blood work every every three to six months and what's fascinating is i have uh, people who get really enthusiastic uh, about a hardcore ketogenic diet you know an 80 percent fat diet and they come in and they've lost weight and they feel great. And they go, man, you know, I've never felt so good. I really felt good. And I go, well, you know, that's interesting because I want, you know, I want you to look at this. Um, you know, I don't really care about LDL, the so-called bad cholesterol, but I do care if your LDL is oxidized, if it's rusty or rancid, because then it really wants to stick to blood vessels. And I really care whether blood vessels themselves are sticky. And we can measure the stickiness of blood vessels, how attractive they are to cholesterol. And I really care about how flexible people's blood vessels are. There's a saying in longevity that you're only as young as your blood vessels are flexible. Mm. And so here 
<laughs> uh, I've had three recently. And they all, man, I feel great. And they're all guys and they're all, you know, buff and they're really good. But their, you know, their LDL has gone up 100 points. And what's worse is their oxidized LDL, which was perfectly fine, is now glowing bright red that it's now oxidized. And the stickiness of their blood vessels, which had always been pristine, is now highly sticky. And their blood vessels, which had always been beautifully flexible, are now stiff as boards. And they go, but, but, but. And I said, look, I'm glad you feel great. And that's wonderful. But look what's happening. You're basically that young swimmer in, swimming in the water from Jaws. And there's a great white shark underneath coming up that is about to bite you. And you're unaware of it, but I can see it. And so here, you're having a great time, but there's a great white shark about to take a bite out of your brain or your heart. And they go, holy cow. Um, and we see this all the time. And one of the reasons I see this is because the standard clean keto diet is virtually void of fiber, of mm. fibrous plants. And it's virtually void of polyphenols, which maybe we'll get into. Um, and so they've eliminated taking care of the real important people in them, and that is their microbiome, their gut buddies. And without prebiotic fiber and without polyphenols, the microbiome can't produce the compounds that we now know stop the oxidation of, L of LDL, stop the stickiness of blood vessels. And I published studies about this in humans and make blood vessels flexible. And it's all gone. So I have nothing wrong with a short-term hardcore keto diet, but this is not a diet for life. I can assure anyone who's listening. Sorry about that. What are some of those gut uh, fermentation byproducts that support arterial flexibility, reduce risk of oxidized LDL? Yeah, so that was really the subject of my last book, and I reprise it in uh, Unlocking the Keto Code. They're postbiotics. And for many people, that's a brand new word. Most people know probiotics, which is the friendly bacteria. A lot of people now know prebiotics, which are these fibers that friendly bacteria eat. But friendly bacteria eat these prebiotics because they make postbiotic. Uh, there's two types of postbiotics. One are short chain fatty acids. Butyrate is the most famous. Butter, believe it or not, gets its name from butyric acid, butyrate. There's a little bit of butyrate in butter, but not so much that Dave Asprey would ever get a benefit from. And, and as you know, he's a friend. We won't, uh, we won't, we won't share that with him. <laughs> I, I've told it to him, his face, but, and we have a good laugh. And so, and the other thing, uh, mm -hmm. acetate, acetic acid, vinegar is a postbiotic, which is a short chain fatty acid. But there are gases that these uh, bacteria make. So hydrogen gas being one of them. Hydrogen sulfide, the rotten egg smell, is actually incredibly important for vascular health. And I mm. show in the book that the right amount of hydrogen sulfide actually prevents atherosclerosis, but too much can actually foster it. Uh, so you have to find that sweet spot Methane gas is actually a very important postbiotic, as is carbon dioxide, which is the major gas in our gut. So all of these things, we know that hydrogen, uh, you know, the, the famous Parkinson study in Japan, where they looked at people with Parkinson's disease and looked at whether their gut microbiome made hydrogen gas. And lo and behold, people with Parkinson's made very little hydrogen gas. They didn't have the microbiome to make it, whereas normal people had plenty of hydrogen gas producing bacteria. So in the study, they gave people with Parkinson's 
hydrogen water, hydrogen dissolved in water, and had them drink it multiple times a day. And lo and behold, their symptoms of Parkinson's uh, got less just by introducing a postbiotic gas. So it's actually, it's really, we're getting to know that there's this incredibly important language between the gut microbiome and our mitochondria that's completely lost. Uh, when we stop feeding these guys what they need to eat. So I'm hearing all the benefits of these gases, but um, Dr. Gundry, it, it sucks to be gassy. So how do we reconcile everything that you're saying without walking around like and feeling like, a, like we're an inflated balloon? Well, first of all, as I said in the last book, step on the gas. Uh, it turns out that you will become adapted to mm. breaking down these prebiotic fibers so that it's just a temporary feeling. But there's other ways to do it. So, for instance, I think one of the most exciting things is we can get the benefit of bacterial fermentation by using vinegars, fermented foods. The benefit of the fermented foods, it turns out, is not in the probiotic bacteria that are in pre fermented foods, but it's actually in the postbiotic compounds that are in fermented foods, like, for instance, the vinegars and other short chain fatty acids. There was a beautiful study out of Stanford last year that actually confirmed that the benefits of fermented foods was actually in increasing the diversity of the microbiome by giving them the compounds that they needed and that fermented foods actually decreased inflammation in human volunteers much better than just prebiotic fiber by themselves. And that's because you're already ingesting preformed postbiotics. So one of the great hacks that I talk about in the book is anytime you can use vinegar, like the miracle of apple cider vinegar is actually in these postbiotic compounds that the apple cider vinegar uses and um, brings. Same way with balsamic vinegar. Uh, anytime you can get balsamic vinegar, apple cider vinegar, uh, take some of your sparkling water, throw a tablespoon, a couple in, you're going to have a fantastic, refreshing drink, and you'll do two wonderful things uh, simultaneously. I love that. Apple cider vinegar, also great to minimize the glycemic impact of starches when Correct. consumed concurrently. Yep. Love that. Okay. So, wow, we've covered so much so already, but getting back to becoming a better fat burner and becoming more metabolically flexible. So what's the secret then? What is the, uh, the secret to becoming a more, uh, a less efficient fat burner? Well, so this gets into um, what's called mitochondrial uncoupling. And believe me, I did not invent the word. I wouldn't have invented that word. Uh, but mitochondrial uncoupling was first described actually when the uh, electron transport chain in mitochondria was finally accepted uh, from um, um, from 1978, Sir Peter um, Mitchell. Uh, got the Nobel Prize for uh, describing the electron transport chain. Let me make it very simple. I go through a real fun way in the book talking about the Mito Club, which is the hippest, hottest, neatest place to be. And people go there to couple. You want to find someone to couple with. Now, Uncoupling sounds like uh, my friend Gwyneth Paltrow's divorce. She <laughs> uncoupled from her marriage. But in fact, we're supposed to, in mitochondria, to produce ATP, couple oxygen with protons, and in the process of coupling, leaving the mitochondria, you produce uh, ATP as a part of that uncoupling, uh, part of that coupling. But making ATP is really damaging to mitochondria. Uh, things couple with things they shouldn't be. Electrons couple with oxygen molecules and really shouldn't be. And that makes reactive oxygen species, free radicals. And most people now know those are really damaging to uh, mitochondria. 
you know, things are hot and steamy and really pressurized in the mito club, in the mitochondria, and it's hard work. So just like a pressure cooker, you need a pop-off valve to release the pressure in pressure cookers when things are getting too dangerous. My mother blew up a pressure cooker when I was growing up. It's very exciting. It was all over the city. <laughs> impressive. And wow. It, it was very impressive. <laughs> I still remember it. Um, so we have, we've got these pop-off valves. And it turns out that mitochondria, to relieve the pressure, if you will, of making ATP, have five different emergency exits in the mitoclub, five emergency pop-off valves. And they're controlled by proteins that are called uncoupling proteins. And the object of the game is to prevent damage to mitochondria. Now, amazingly enough, you and I sitting here, 30% of all the energy, uh, all the calories going into our mitochondria are uncoupled from making ATP in our mitochondria. They're released via back doors, these emergency exits. 30%. Now you think about it, Max, what a dumb design that we literally waste 30% of the calories we eat to protect our mitochondria. It's that important. What do we do with those wasted calories? We actually generate heat and we're a warm-blooded animal. Even interestingly enough, cold-blooded animals actually have to maintain a temperature. And so they're actually uncoupled as well, but not as vigorously as, as animals, uh, mammals. So we waste a huge amount of calories already. So imagine if things are getting really tough, we even open up more floodgates to waste even more energy. And it turns out that ketones actually work by opening up these trapdoors, these escape valves, and wasting more calories. And so rather than becoming an efficient fat burner, you actually become a fat waster. And that's actually where weight loss comes from. To the untrained person listening, the heart, the brain, the gut, completely disconnected organ systems. So what is then the connection? How does the gut influence the heart, the brain? Well, I got interested in the gut uh, because I became convinced working with my patients um, that leaky gut was actually the cause of coronary artery disease. And I went out uh, to figure out you know, why th that was happening. Um, you know, uh, Dale Bredesen, um, you know, end of Alzheimer's, uh, started looking at the gut because uh, he realized that amyloid is actually produced in the gut. Uh, that's where it comes from initially. And he started feeling and, and finding that amyloid leaking out of the gut and then getting it into the brain is a piece of the process that um, facilitates more amyloid and tau production in the brain. And I think both of us uh, and others, obviously, um, began to realize that there are when bacterial particles actually leak through the wall of the gut, this sets up a we'll talk about the brain for a minute, a, an early warning system with our microglial cells. You know, microglial cells are the bodyguards of the brain. They're specialized immune cells, as you know. And they're, they're basically you know, the bodyguards of neurons. And uh, just for our viewers and listeners, neurons talk to other neurons via dendritic processes. They grow telephone lines to talk to the next guy. And what happens is that if the microglia are alerted that mischief is happening down below in the gut and that literally bacterial particles and or lectins are loose, that the microglia to protect the neurons actually begin to munch away on the dendritic processes of the neurons to literally kind of call the troops back into the mother fort and pull up the drawbridge. And this was actually first discovered 
with Lewy bodies and Lewy body dementia. Uh, the, one of the hallmarks of Parkinson's is a dead neuron surrounded by glial cells. And the shocker was that you could find Lewy bodies in the neurons in, in the gut, in the gut wall. And they're going, well, what the heck are those guys doing there? Why is a dead neuron surrounded by glial cells? And people started putting two, to, two together and said, wait a minute, Parkinson's doesn't come from the brain and then associates with constipation. Parkinson's begins in the wall of the gut and goes to the brain. Um, and it's like, holy cow, you know, we, we got all this so backwards. Fascinating. There was that study a couple of years ago, right, with patients that had undergone a vagotomy yep. where they had the vagus nerve severed. And there was a when they tracked these patients over time, there was a dramatic risk reduction for those that underwent this procedure for developing Parkinson's disease. Yeah, 50 percent reduction. Uh, in people who had a vagotomy, which was our old way of treating ulcer disease. Um, I did a lot of vagotomies when I was training as a general surgeon. And yeah, so they, they were able to track these people for you know 50 years. And people uh, who had vagotomies uh, had much less Parkinson. And it was actually a study that I cited in the, the Plant Paradox that you can actually trace lectins climbing the vagus nerve to the brain in animal models uh, of leaky gut. And so it's like, holy cow, who, you know, who could have imagined, except Hippocrates, that the things that were happening in the gut was, uh, was, hap was happening to our blood vessels, was happening to our brain. And there is a uh, autoimmune theory of heart disease that I like. And uh, we attack our own blood vessels uh, because of things leaking from our gut. Rather than cholesterol being the, you know, the evil empire, uh, Michael DeBakey, one of the world's most famous fathers of heart surgery from Houston, Texas, used to say that cholesterol has nothing to do with heart disease, that it was an innocent bystander and that it was just kind of a patch that was patching irritated spots on blood vessels, kind of like a, you know, a, a patch on a pothole. And the more things got irritated, the more patch was applied, but it, it itself wasn't the culprit. It was just, you know, it was there patching your inflammation. Wow. Fascinating. So when you see somebody that presents with high cholesterol, do you treat the cholesterol first? Do you look to see what may be causing the cholesterol to be elevated? Yeah. So uh, I actually had a great patient today with that with a similar story. This is a woman who is now in her late 50s who runs total cholesterols well into the five and six hundreds. Wow. And she um, has Used to, when I first met her, she had an LDL cholesterol of 469. Wow. And, yeah. And she actually ate a lot of carbohydrates, a lot of sugars, and but fairly thin. And through, uh, through the years, a uh, couple of years, we now have her triglycerides, which used to be about 400. Uh, we got her down to 79 uh, today, and now her HDL is actually higher than her triglycerides. And we have very sophisticated ways of now measuring whether uh, cholesterol is activated, whether it's sticky, whether it wants to stick to blood vessels. And for the first time, actually, this morning, she no longer has, uh, it's called OxPL-APOB. And it's a really cool measurement of the entire oxidized uh, spectrum of cholesterol that uh, is in us. And there's a few labs that now are offering this. If you can't get that, most labs like Quest and LabCorp will measure oxidized LDL, which is a good second uh, placeholder. And I have people with, you know, Two, 300 LDLs 
they don't they don't oxidize their LDL, uh, thankfully, following my diet. And so I don't worry about them um, as long as they're not oxidizing their cholesterol. They, they can have a high cholesterol. There was this really interesting paper that I was reading just a couple of, uh, of weeks ago that found I believe it was a I believe it was a trial where they fed people a diet enriched with olive oil and then compared it to a diet enriched with linoleic acid, which is the fatty acid found predominantly in grain and seed oils like canola oil, corn oil, soybean oil, grapeseed oil, you name it. Um, all, all of those industrially refined oils that the standard American diet is just a wash in. And they found that for the because the, the 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 fats that we eat, correct me if I'm wrong or if I'm speaking, you know, if I'm if I'm miscommunicating this, integrate themselves into all aspects of our physiology, not least of which are LDL lipoproteins. And so when you enrich our your LDL lipoproteins with monounsaturated fat, which extra virgin olive oil is is abundant in, it seems to to dramatically reduce the risk that those particles are going to get oxidized, that they're going to be able to adhere to um, immune cells, which could then potentially create the foam cell that initiates atherosclerosis. Did I properly communicate uh, describe that? Yeah, but there's actually a, a, a more important proviso that I think has been missed about monounsaturated fats. Um, a few years ago, I met with the, the head of the Olive Oil Council in, in Italy, who was a physician. And he said, you know, people don't need to understand that monounsaturated fat, oleic acid, is nothing unique, but it's a carrier for the polyphenols that are actually the beneficial part of olive oil mm. and that the more polyphenols that you have in olive oil the better and he says people should just kind of forget about monounsaturated fats but should think about the amount of polyphenols that is being carried and it's the polyphenols that actually prevent the oxidation of, of LDL. And years ago, I published a paper looking at flexibility in blood vessels and inflammation in blood vessels, which we can measure. And we had people follow a, a low lectin diet, but put them on grapeseed extract and have them use olive oil and another polyphenol called pycnogenol, French maritime tree bark, hmm. and some fish oil. And we showed that when they did this, their blood vessels became flexible, the markers of inflammation on their blood vessels went away. And then once these people had normal looking numbers, a number of them said, oh, good, my blood vessels are great now. I don't have to do the olive oil, I don't have to take the supplements. And a bunch of these people came back for the next blood work and we're back to square one. They're stiff blood vessels, they're inflamed. And I'm going, what the heck happened? They said, oh, well, I was so good. I don't, I don't need those anymore. And mm -hmm. so we put them back on it. And within three months, we were back looking at normal blood vessels. It's actually kind of fun. Wow. You're kind of famous at this point for saying that food exists to draw extra virgin <laughs> olive oil into your mouth. That's so true. Uh, you know, there's several of the blue zones use a liter of olive oil per week. Uh, there's a very famous study out of Spain, the Predamed study, uh, looking at 65-year-old individuals uh, who uh, had known coronary artery disease. They had a stent or a bypass, and they were followed for five, year, uh, five years. They were compared, they were put on a Mediterranean diet with a liter of olive oil per week. And they actually had to take their container of olive oil to the clinic empty and exchange it every week. So wow. I knew now they could have been pouring it out, but I doubt it. <laughs> and they were compared to a low fat Mediterranean diet. And in fact, the olive oil group uh, had lots of amazing changes. They actually had a demonition in the new events uh, compared to the low fat group who had still accelerated events. From the brain standpoint, it turns out their, uh, their memory the olive oil group had improved memory at the end of five years when they hit 70 wow. than they had when they were 65. The low fat group had no benefit. And then a, an interesting side point of the study was that women uh, had a, I'm blanking on the right number, I think about a 70% 
decrease in breast cancer in the high dose olive oil group compared to the low fat group. And it's like, holy cow. I mean, you know, so the only purpose of food is to get olive oil into your mouth. You're mm-hmm. right. That, and that's the PREDIMED study. That's a, that's, a, that's a seminal study in the field of nutrition because it's a randomized controlled trial. It was multi-center, large population, long term. Yeah, and the, the fascinating thing is the the low fat vegan community uh, community just thinks that study should be you know thrown in the trash that it was <laughs> fraudulent and it, it, it's like come on it, really and. Why is that? Because because th- because there are some within the vegan community that think that all oils are unhealthy. Is that correct. it? Right. Yeah. And that you know that that came really you know out of the the seven countries style uh, trial, which really wasn't a seven countries uh, with with Dr. Keys and the idea that saturated fat was somehow you know evil and that heart disease was caused by you know saturated fat consumption and in the seven countries study and i talk a lot about it in the new book unlocking the keto code um dr keys picked the seven countries that he wanted to show was the problem and so he he chose the united states he chose japan he chose finland he chose italy uh, he chose um the netherlands and he didn't chose choose france um and because if you look at france it totally upsets his model uh the french eat uh, three times as much cheese and butter that Americans do. And yet the French have a third of the coronary artery disease that Americans do. And it doesn't fit the model. And Mm -hmm. sadly, uh, when things don't fit the model, you tend to uh, throw them out. Yeah, Uh, it's it's a so-called French paradox. Yeah, it's uh, there's a really great book. Uh, I'm blanking on the author. It's up here on my shelf someplace. Uh, the the former food editor for Vogue wrote a book called uh, called I Can't Believe I Ate the Whole Thing, and uh, he had a whole chapter on oh, why aren't the French dead, and it was all about you know this enormous amount of cheese uh, that the French eat and you know why aren't they dead and I, I go into actually why that is in the new book there's actually a really good reason for it oh man well you can't like leave us hanging like that well I'll give you a tease um actually I'll give you a really good tease uh, I cut it <laughs> uh, my editor cut it from the book because it was it was too I think in people's faces so uh, the Blue Zones, Dan Butner coined the Blue Zone and, uh, you know, with National Geographic. And these are places in the world uh, where people live the longest and healthiest. And they do have some common features that both Dan and I agree with. I happen to have spent most of my career in the only Blue Zone in the United States, Loma Linda, California, where I was a professor. And I'm actually the only nutritionist, as far as I know, who's spent most of his life in a Blue Zone. And one of the unique things about two of the blue zones that gets missed, Sardinia and the Nagoya Peninsula of Costa Rica. And these are supposedly really, really healthy places because they eat a lot of grains and they eat a lot of beans. And in fact, they do eat a lot of grains and they do eat a lot of beans. But if you look at the Sardinians who have longevity, they live up in the hills and they don't come down to the sea. They are sheep and goat herders. Uh, The people who live down by the sea, and this has been done, do not have increased longevity. Only the people who live in the mountainous areas. And so you look at the difference in their diet, and there's one difference in their diet, and that is the folks who live up in the mountain eat a huge amount of goat and sheep cheeses. Mm. Mm. You look at the Nagoya Peninsula, yes, they eat corn and beans, but what makes them unique compared to other parts of Costa Rica is their sheep and goat herders, and they eat a huge amount of goat and sheep cheese. So what is it about goat and sheep cheese that makes them have such longevity? Well, there's actually 
two factors, actually three. One, goat and sheep milk is 30% medium chain triglycerides. Wow. Wow. So you're getting MCT oil every time you eat a a goat or a sheep product, Mm. whether it's goat yogurt, whether it's goat cheese. The second thing that cheeses produce in the fermentation process is polyamines. And I wrote about this in the previous books. So polyamines, uh, one of the most famous is spermidine and your Listeners can guess where that was that name came from. <laughs> and there's another one called putrescine. And cheeses, aged cheeses, are loaded with these compounds. And these compounds actually promote longevity. And the T's of how they pronounce promote longevity, um, you'll find in the book, and it's not what you think. Um, so there's The other thing that's cool about MCT oil, as most people know, is that MCT oil is taken directly from the gut to the liver, where it is converted instantaneously to ketone bodies. And ketone bodies are not a miraculous fuel. So anybody who's uh, into ketone, sorry, guys, you're going to have to read the book, but ketones are a horrible fuel. Mm. But ketones are signaling molecules that tell our mitochondria to actually repair themselves and make more of themselves. And it's, it's a process called mitochondrial uncoupling. And it's the whole premise of why going in and out of ketosis on a 24 hour basis is so good for you, but it's why MCT oil is so good for you because you can actually produce ketones without being on a high fat ketogenic diet. For instance, I would joke about this. So I could have a fruit salad and have goat yogurt and I would manufacture ketones. And this has actually been shown very well, even though I had that, big giant fructose bomb, but I'd still make ketones. That is fascinating. Yeah. I mean, I think a lot of people think that the magic of ketones and ketogenic diets, especially as they pertain to neurological conditions is that they provide this alternate fuel source. But I think it's, it is an underappreciated aspect of ketone bodies that they do have this signaling effect. Yeah. And, and even, and this was work that that came out of uh, Harvard with Dr. Cahill and Dr. Owens, even at full ketosis, uh, the brain, as you know, um, still wants 30 to 40% of its needs met by glucose. And even at full ketosis, and as Dr. Owens showed in uh, the early 2000s, in human volunteers, that even at full ketosis, only 30% of human energy needs are met by ketones. That's it, at full ketosis. Uh, Free fatty acids are obviously how we meet our energy needs, but as you know, free fatty acids are too big to get past the blood brain barrier at any speed. Uh, And ketones exist because they're short chain fatty acids that are water water soluble that easily pass through the brain. But their benefit was not as a super fuel for the brain. Their benefit is actually the signaling effect of mitochondrial uncoupling that actually treats neurons to a treat that uh, is not as a fuel. Wow. But, and it's in the book. Amazing. No, I, I, I can't wait to get my hands on it. Um, I know. I can't believe you do not have your hands on it. I, I know. Apologize. I, I Shame know. on well, me. Well, no, I mean, I mean, I love all your other books, so I'm sure that, uh, that I'm going to enjoy this one as well. So wait, in, d- during states, during starvation, the brain obviously is going to use ketones, but the, the free fatty acids, what are those taken up and, and, and oxidized by like muscle? So, yeah. So free fatty acids are used by muscle uh, as their primary fuel. The other thing that happens is as long as you can release free fatty acids from fat and people don't realize if they're insulin resistant, guess what? Uh, You're not going to release free fatty acids out of your fat cells. Insulin blocks it. So free fatty acids can then part 
go to the liver where they're made into ketone bodies. But the reason ketone bodies exist is to keep the brain holding on until the, the next meal arrives. And so they're not, they're not a miracle fuel. I, I, I used to think they were a miracle fuel. They're not. Um, well, it seems like the influence that ketone bodies have on the brain is something that our hunter-gatherer ancestors would have experienced on a daily, monthly, seasonal, annual basis. At least some point in the year, you, it's, it would be safe to assume that a hunter-gatherer was experiencing that their brain was, having, was getting access to these ketone bodies. Correct. In fact, it should happen every day. Uh, normally, and I talk about this in the book, normally we should cycle in and out of ketosis on a daily basis. Uh, after about eight, if, an, if you have no, metabolic flexibility, and that means the ability to either use glucose or amino acids to generate ATP, or use free fatty acids to generate ATP, if you have the ability to switch back and forth on those fuel choices, which is metabolic flexibility, then you, sh you actually have perfect health. Half of normal weight individuals in the United States have no metabolic flexibility. Half. 88% of overweight individuals have no metabolic flexibility. And 99% of obese individuals have no metabolic flexibility. And what's so scary about that is uh, we, most people are addicted to using glucose as their only source of fuel for their neurons, uh, which is actually pretty scary. Um, and it's no wonder when we develop insulin resistance in the brain, type three diabetes of the brain, that our nerve cells start dying because they're mm. literally starving to death because they can't. You won't generate ketones as a backup fuel for the brain. Wow. So what are some, I mean, what are some high level, high level, low hanging fruit that um, can help people regain metabolic flexibility? If you're saying it's such a minority of us that are truly metabolically flexible, what are some things that we can do to fix that situation? Well, I think the easiest way, and this is, uh, you know, really uh, sentinel work by uh, Raphael de Cabo from the NIH, where I was a fellow uh, years ago, but he became convinced that the benefit of calorie restriction, which is really one of the only known ways to extend lifespan in most organisms, the benefit wasn't in actually the calorie restriction. It was the fact that in animal models, you put out the food usually on a daily basis, and the calorie restricted animals were basically so hungry that they ate all their food almost immediately. And that it was the period of time, the extended period of time that the animals weren't eating, who were calorie restricted, that explained the difference, that it was actually the period of time uh, that they were fasting every 24 hours that was the difference. And he designed a really cool mouse model uh, at the NIH to prove it. And in fact, he showed that it was the timing of the meal and how long the mouse had to eat that meal that made all the difference. Um, and he found, for instance, that mice could be given a full day's ration. But if you put it out at three o'clock in the afternoon, that they'd finish their full day's ration in about 12 hours, and then they'd be fasting for 12 hours, which is actually a long time for a mouse. And he compared those mice to mice who got to munch on their food bowl, you know, 24 hours a day. And he found that the mice who got to munch 24 hours a day had no metabolic flexibility. But the mice who got the exact same amount of food, but it was controlled when they got it, had metabolic flexibility. And the cool thing is the mice who got the full amount of food, but in a confined eating space, lived 11% longer than the mice who got the same amount of food. And they rarely died of cancer, which is a big cause of mice. And 
they didn't have any amyloid plaques in their brain compared to the uh, all day munchers, as I call them. So action plan, the more we compress our eating window down to about six to eight hours every day, uh, which is doable and in the energy paradox and in the new book, I take people through an easy way to do it. Just one hour a week change over a five week period will get you to compress your eating window and easily, easily done. And that can have just such a profound effect. For instance, if you extrapolate the mice study, doing that and still getting everything you want to eat uh, will extend a human's lifespan by good lifespan by 10 years. Hmm. Not bad. That's, I mean, that's amazing. <laughs> yeah, not bad. Yeah, it's not <laughs> bad. But I mean, when you're eating, you still have to eat you still have to be mindful of what you're eating, right? Like just the, the just compressing your feeding window isn't a free pass to eat all the crap you no, want. Right? No, as I write as I write in my books, that does not allow you and me to have a pound of M and M peanuts as as our you know sole food. <laughs> uh, Darn yeah, it. That, and in fact, that was shown in the study. Uh, one of the groups of animals were given actually a high sugar uh, diet. And they still got the benefits, but interestingly enough, the high sugar rats, when they die, they died of liver cancer, aggressive liver cancer compared to the non high sugar rats. Um, so you're right. And there's no true free pass. Um, yeah, you can't have your cake and eat it too. But it does seem to confer benefits, which I think is a very empowering um, insight to have, especially for people who don't necessarily have access to the kind of pristine food environment that you or I have access to. No, you're right. Uh, and I think that's also brought home fascinating uh, Italian uh, athlete study that I mentioned in the book. They took uh, sets of Italian cyclists and they, for three months, gave them the exact same amount of food. Uh, and they divided them in, into two groups. <clears throat> One group ate a 12 hour eating window. They have breakfast at eight o'clock, they had lunch at one and they had to finish dinner by eight o'clock in the after, in the evening. The other group got the same amount of food, same training table. They ate breakfast break fast at one o'clock in the afternoon. They had lunch at four o'clock in the afternoon and they had to finish dinner by eight o'clock. So they had basically a seven hour eating window. What's fascinating is only the same amount of food, only the compressed eating window athletes lost weight. The regular guys did not lose any weight. They maintained their muscle mass. But what's probably most striking is their insulin-like growth factors, IGF-1, which is probably our best predicate marker for longevity, uh, fell. And the folks who ate you know, the 12-hour window had no uh, fall in their insulin-like growth factor. And when I look at super old people in my practice, late 90s, early 100s, these people all run insulin-like growth factors of 50 to 70. And uh, that's where you want to be. And so if, so if just compressing your eating window will let you lose weight and lower your insulin-like growth factor, you know, bring it on. Bring it on. Yeah. I, I, I aim to not eat for an hour or two or three sometimes after I wake up and I try my best not to eat for two to three hours before I go to sleep. Yeah. I find it much easier to control when I have my first meal of the day. It's a little bit more tricky to control when I have my last meal of the day because dinner tends to be our big social meal. Correct. Yeah. That's, um, uh... You know, if you're probably going to design the perfect intermittent fasting diet, you'd, you'd probably maybe have breakfast at nine o'clock in the morning and finish at three o'clock in the afternoon. Mm. But you're right. It's nearly impossible. You know, I'm, I'm now entering my, my 23rd year from January through June. During the week, I condense all my meals to one meal a day. Wow. In, a, in a two hour window between six and eight o'clock at night. Now, why do I do that? Well, because that's when my wife and I are home, you know, and that's when we see each other. So 
would I be smarter, you know, to compress my eating window, maybe midday? Yeah. But then I watch my wife eat dinner and, you know, I'd, I'd probably strangle her. <laughs> but, you know, so it's actually doable, but you're right. It's much easier to delay the first meal of the day in general. I love than, that. Then try to bring it down the other way. Ketones in the form of, well, ketones, um, whether, whether derived from a ketogenic diet, which is essentially a starvation mimicking diet, correct, or ketogenic fats like medium chain triglycerides all correct. have this effect. Yeah. The, the, the brilliance is when it was discovered that uh, medium chain triglycerides are unlike any fat in that they are absorbed directly through the wall of the gut. They don't need a transport molecule called chylomicrons. They go directly through the portal vein into the liver. And in the liver, they're converted into ketones, regardless of what else you're eating. Now, think of the implications of that. And the mind boggles, but I could tell someone to have a fresh fruit salad. And you know me, I would never tell anybody to have a fresh fruit salad, but we won't go that direction. <laughs> and have a tablespoon of MCT oil. You will actually generate ketones, even though you ate a high carbohydrate meal, just because you had MCTs. Now, that's why the MCT based. Uh, anti-seizure diet actually works so well because they could give kids a lot more carbohydrates and a lot more proteins. And it became a very palatable way to get a kid to eat food. But we can get that same benefit. The great benefit is, unfortunately, the vast majority of people, because they have high insulin levels and because they're not metabolically flexible, they can't generate ketones for weeks and weeks doing a ketogenic diet because their insulin levels prevent fat release from fat cells. Insulin blocks a hormone called hormone-sensitive lipase from being expressed. Hormone-sensitive lipase. Gee, I wonder what hormone, hormone-sensitive lipase is sensitive to? Insulin. Mm -hmm. So when insulin's up, which would store fat normally, you wouldn't want fat to come out. So insulin blocks this hormone-sensitive lipase. When insulin falls, then hormone-sensitive lipase liberates fat out of fat stores as free fatty acids. But since most people have elevated insulin levels and are metabolically inflexible, you could literally go on a ketogenic diet and wait weeks and weeks to actually begin to liberate free fatty acids. And this has actually been shown, if you look at the literature and dive into it deeply, in a low-carb ketogenic diet versus a normal carb diet for weight loss. And several of these studies, using actually hundreds of people, have shown that the basal metabolic rate, the fat-burning rate, if you will, takes about three to four weeks on a low-carb diet to begin to start wasting fat, burning fat as a fuel. And until you get to that point, you're not going to really have much effect uh, because you're really actually not generating ketones because it takes a long time for your insulin levels to fall. And that's what's so frustrating about you know, starting a ketogenic diet, because without ketone generation, your brain goes, what the heck? What have I got to eat around here? I'm, you know, I'm literally starving to death. And, you know, you get the Adkins blue or the keto flu, your athletic performance drops. I have a bunch of athletes who try a ketogenic diet and they just, you know, come back after a week. This, this sucks. You know, I, I have, I can't wait, lift half the weight. I can't go on the treadmill longer. I'm, you know, I'm leaving this. Uh, and so that's one of the big, big problems with the ketogenic diet. So there seems to be, there seems to be a hunger suppressing effect and, and a metabolic advantage to being in ketosis. Is this how in your, is this why in your estimate estimation, it's beneficial to be on a ketogenic diet as opposed to a, uh, a non-ketogenic diet, but a diet that places one in, into a, into a calorie deficit? Because I guess what I'm trying to ask is we know that 
the, a calorie deficit is the key to lose weight. And you can, you can be any, you can, you can be ingesting any combination of macronutrients so long as you're in a, in a calorie deficit. Um, and that's one way. That's one way. Right. But there's a better way. Okay. So, so ex- expound on that a little bit because you're still, because people on a ketogenic diet, if they're in a calorie surplus, as you mentioned, they're still going to gain weight, correct? They do gain weight, except. So the best study, uh, and I, I go into the nuances of why ketones exert a, a, a beneficial weight loss effect. But the best study was done with Italian athletes, uh, Italian cyclists. And they were put on a training table for three months where everybody had to eat the exact same food. And they had to finish their plates at every meal. They were divided into two groups based on the timing of their meals. One group went on a 12-hour eating schedule where they ate breakfast at 8 o'clock in the morning, they ate lunch at 1 o'clock in the afternoon, and they had to finish dinner by 8 o'clock at night, a 12-hour eating window. The other group of athletes had the same food. They went on a seven-hour window. They had break fast breakfast at one o'clock in the afternoon. They had lunch at four o'clock in the afternoon, and they had to finish dinner at eight o'clock at night. Same amount of calories. Calories in, calories out, right? Nope. The group that had a compressed eating window to seven hours lost weight, even though they were eating the same calories as the 12-hour guys. And the group in the seven-hour eating window dramatically lowered their insulin-like growth factor one, IGF-1, which is still the best blood measurement for whether mTOR is activated or not. They had equal athletic performance. It didn't suffer. So even though they were all eating the same calories, it was the compression of the eating window. So what happened? Well, it turns out that, as I mentioned before, we if we have metabolic flexibility, we start making ketones after about eight hours after stopping eating. And we really ramp up to ketone production at 12 hours. But so the athletes on the 12 hour eating window, they were just starting to ramp up ketone production and then they started eating and that stopped their ketones. The other guys, they were ramping up their ketone production at 12 hours, but then they added another five hours of making ketones before they stopped ketone production. So they had an additional five hours of ketones telling mitochondria to waste fuel. Mm. Ah, And this has actually been done in studies with MCT oil-based diets versus olive oil diets. And even in humans, people who got MCT oil instead of olive oil, equal calories, had a three to five kilogram weight loss advantage to having the same calories as olive oil. And you know me, I'm the only purpose of food is to get olive oil into your mouth, right? (laughs) Uh, But they had even equal calories. The fact that MCTs were turning into ketones, they were uncoupling their mitochondria and wasting fuel. So a calorie is not a calorie where ketones are concerned. And we can use that in, in the book if I, I hold your hand and I don't want you tomorrow, folks, to have your first meal at noon, most people fall flat on their face. But if I ask you, OK, if you eat breakfast at seven o'clock next week, let's eat breakfast at eight o'clock. Come on. One hour. That's all I ask for you. We'll do that for five days and then we'll take the weekend off. And believe it or not, there's beautiful human studies that weekends don't count in this regimen. The next week. Come on, we're going to go to nine o'clock. That's only an hour more than last week, which you were able to do. And each week, over five weeks, we hold your hand and we get to noon as the time you start eating. And then we ask you to stop eating at seven o'clock or adjust accordingly. And so you'll become this (laughs) fat waster in no time. And it'll be actually remarkably easy. And you don't have to follow a high fat diet to achieve it. It's amazing. So it, it sounds like it's not necessarily refuting en- the energy balance model of obesity. It just sounds like you're boosting the calories outside of the equation. You're, That's exactly right. You're literally wasting them. 
you, they do not contribute to um, ATP production. Now that sounds stupid, but as as I talk about in the book, one of the papers that really changed my whole way of looking at this is there's a researcher by the name of Martin Brand. And in 2000, he wrote a paper called Uncoupling to Survive. Simple title. It's actually a very simple paper. And what he proposed, and it's since been confirmed by many researchers, is if you're starving to death, and let's face it, ketones were produced in starvation. That's why they exist. Um, If you're starving to death and your mitochondria don't make it, you're dead. Uh, That's it. So mitochondria should protect themselves at all costs from dying. They should protect themselves at all costs. They should repair themselves and do anything they can do not to damage themselves. And we know that making ATP is really damaging. So he proposed that in extremis, ketones are a signaling system to tell mitochondria, okay, everybody from themselves, you got to save yourself at all costs. And the way to do it is don't hurt yourselves making energy and just throw a lot of the calories away and protect yourselves. Now, you sit there and go, wait a minute, if you're starving to death, you need every last little calorie. That makes no sense. But paradoxically, it actually makes sense because the mitochondria have to protect themselves. But part two of the equation is when mitochondria are stressed and getting ketones, they're told to make more of themselves, mitogenesis, to carry the workload. And that's really the the key of what he was talking about. And I use the example, let's suppose we're on a dog sled and we have one dog. Um, that dog uh, can pull us uh, not very well, uh, and he doesn't eat very much. But if we want to make it the long term, we ought to get a sled of six dogs. Each dog will do one sixth the work of the own, of the single dog, and they'll go a whole lot farther with one catch. You now have to feed six dogs instead of one dog. So they're actually going to burn through more calories in an effort to keep each dog working less. And so it it turns out it's actually a brilliant design. The more you stimulate mitochondria with ketones to protect themselves and work less, the more they make more of themselves to share the workload. And the more sharing of the workload with less individual stress means you're in you're going to win the Iditarod every time. You're going to go a very long time. Wow. So cool. Okay. So you've talked about the benefits of curtailing your last meal of the day and, 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 and having an earlier dinner if, if, if If feasible, if possible. (laughs) Um, but walk me through, walk me through a day of eating, uh, in accordance with unlocking the keto code and, and everything that we know about reconciling, everything that you've just shared with my audience with um, what we know about gut health and, 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 and reaping the most postbiotics that we can from our foods. What does a day of, of eating look like for you? Well, for me, or on uh, this plan, well, on this plan, Oh, on this plan. So what I want to do is slowly step people um, down to somewhere between a six to eight hour window of eating. If they want to go crazy like I do, uh, we'll do we'll do an OMAD diet, one meal a day. And I've written about this. This is, I think, my 22nd year of from January through June, eating one meal a day during the week. I eat all my calories between six and eight o'clock at night. Should I eat them between four and six o'clock at night? Yes, but my wife and I aren't home, you know, until about six. And it's kind of when we have dinner and that's when we do it. Should I really do it? Maybe at noon to two o'clock? Yeah, but that's impractical because then I wouldn't, wouldn't watch my wife eat at night. That's kind of dumb. So I've been doing that for 22 years and I take time off on the weekends like I have people do. And uh, that it works. I'm 22 years of it. Um, it wow. works. Impressive. No, no problem. 
But Dr. Masson from the NIH has also shown that probably the perfect window of eating is about six hours. Um, once you get to 12 hours, sorry, uh, things don't work out like the Italian athletes did. But the more I can, and most Americans, as I've talked about in other books, eat 16 hours a day, literally from sun up to sundown. We're constantly eating. And no wonder we have no metabolic flexibility. That's number one. Number two, we're asking mitochondria to do work a very long time and they need to rest. Uh, they need to rest. Our gut, believe it or not, needs to rest. Uh, digestion is really energy intensive and very damaging to the gut wall. The longer you have contact working the gut wall, the more opportunity you have for da danger, damage, and the less opportunity you have to repair the gut wall. So there's a lot of good reasons uh, that our design was never to eat constantly during the day. And we know from modern hunter-gatherers that breakfast is, it's like, what is breakfast? Um, there are, you know, there's, there's no bowl of oatmeal in the cupboard. They have to find breakfast. There's no storage systems. And they usually find breakfast 10 or 11 o'clock in the morning. And that's when they break their fast. Amazing. Um, yeah, I mean, breakfast, it's a modern construct, right? Probably, oh, yeah. probably it's, drilled into our, into our collective brains by cereal companies. Absolutely. And there's, I mean, there's pretty cool evidence that cereal companies were the main driver of this breakfast is the most important meal of the day. Yikes. So I'm take, I take it that I take it that it's a lower carbohydrate diet, but one that is not deprived of microbiota accessible carbohydrates, AKA dietary fiber, which, right. you, which you touched on as being, as being quite beneficial. Right. Yeah. It's, uh, that's really one of the three <coughs> pillars of, of the, of the plan. It's reducing your eating window. It's making sure that the carbohydrates you eat are number one, loaded with soluble fiber. And number two, that the carbohydrates you eat are polyphenol laden carbohydrates. And Polyphenols, it turns out, are these plant compounds that give the vivid colors to uh, plant fruits, to plant leaves. The beautiful co fall colors are actually the polyphenols in those leaves that we now see when the chlorophyll uh, goes away from the leaves. So all those bright colors are the polyphenols. And we know that polyphenols are actually used by plant mitochondria, which are called chloroplasts, uh, to protect them from mm -hmm. the damage of sunlight. Sunlight is very damaging to plants. Uh, plants need photons to generate energy. Uh, they're the equivalent of protons for us. And we need oxygen to generate energy. And oxygen is very damaging to us. So plants use polyphenols to protect themselves. It turns out they work by uncoupling the plant's mitochondria. Son of a gun. So when we eat polyphenols, two things happen. They're actually prebiotics to our gut bacteria. The gut bacteria in turn turn these polyphenols into accessible compounds that then uncouple our mitochondria. So it's a, I, I keep hearing the circle of life from the Disney movie, The Lion King. <laughs> you know, we eat plants and then we feed the plants and it, there's obviously a pretty cool grand design in all this, uh, but yeah. So we have to have the fight, the plants that we do eat, the carbohydrates that we do eat should be focused on getting, eating the rainbow. And so when we think of eating the rainbow, it turns out that that advice is actually to get in mitochondrial uncoupling polyphenols in our diet every day. What are some of your favorite uh, polyphenol rich plants? Well, so, uh, well, I'm actually drinking a polyphenol rich plant. I'm having tea right now. Uh, tea is loaded with polyphenols. That's a Coffee. massive cup. That's like, 
I don't know if it's I, the angle. It's as big, it's, it's bigger than your head. It, it is a large cup. Well, it's it's pretty big. No, okay. So it's a, I, it was a weird perspective thing. Yeah, but. and I and I get uh, I get uh, about three of these giant cups with each with about five different bags of tea in it per day, and I've been doing that for many years. Just. To, uncouple my mitochondria. Coffee. Uh, you know the studies in brain health and coffee. People who have five cups of coffee a day have, you know, dramatically, uh, dramatic reduction in Parkinson's and dementia compared to people who drink less coffee. And that's because coffee actually has two mitochondrial couplers, not only the polyphenols in coffee, but also caffeine. And caffeine is a great mitochondrial uncoupler. And that's why one of the things that happens when people have a cup of coffee, even it might be an iced coffee, they notice that they get hot. They might even get a little glistening on their forehead because they're actually thermogenic compounds. And they're thermogenic because you're wasting calories and creating heat. Cool. Dark chocolate, who knew? Great mitochondrial uncoupler. But all of, of the dark, you know, green vegetables, the colorful vegetables, like get yourself some Swiss chard. Perfect. It's a great mitochondrial uncoupler. Dr. Gundry, did you see the recent study that showed that caffeine is a natural PCSK9 inhibitor? Yes, indeed. Uh, why don't yeah. you, you're the, you're the cardiologist here. Why don't you, uh, why don't you unpack that for the audience? Cause I thought it was so cool. Yeah, so caffeine actually is the PCSK9 inhibitor that the new uh, Repatha drugs uh, work on, injectable drugs, to prevent uh, LDL, uh, well, to prevent LDL receptors from forming. So caffeine will actually uh, lower your uh, LDLs and get you more of the type of LDLs you want. So why get an injection? Just have, you know, several cups of coffee per day. Boom. I love that, especially for APOE4 carriers who are thought to be poor uh, LDL recyclers, right? You're correct. Yeah. And yeah, so I've been trying to get my APOE4 folks who, you know, constitute a big part of my practice uh, to, you know, get their caffeine. And coffee is a great way. Tea does have caffeine. It has uh, other compounds instead. But Tea definitely is a way to get caffeine into your diet. You know that that's how I first, well before you were a multi-platinum New York Times bestselling author, that's how I originally found out about your work, right? Because you were, you became very popular in the APOE4 community, right. which was something that I discovered through my journey with my mom and, and the right. dementia that she had. Yeah, it's interesting. I got interested in the APOE4 gene as a, as a heart surgeon and cardiologist because it's a very, you know, good predictor of developing heart disease, cerebral vascular disease. And I really wanted to find out, well, you know, why is this and what can I do about it? Little did I know, well, I knew uh, Dr. Dale Bredesen, who's now become a good friend of mine, uh, came at it from a neurologist standpoint. And, you know, I would just glom onto his work. And a number of years ago, we were introduced at a meeting and Dr. Bresson, Dr. Henry, Dr. Gunnery, this is Dr. Bresson. And Dr. Bresson says, oh, you know, Dr. Gunnery, big fan. I go, really? He says, oh, your work is fantastic. Oh, my gosh, I'm, you know, so honored. I, I know every paper you've ever written, you know, oh, you know, bow down to the, the God. And we've had good friendship ever since when we send each other papers. Did you know this? And, oh, I didn't know that. Oh, thanks. Yeah. So. Yeah. And so, and I was talking to David Perlmutter a few weeks ago, and I said, you know, isn't it hilarious that uh, two neurologists and a heart surgeon cardiologist would meet down in the gut and realize that, you know, all our specialties are intertwined because, you know, humbling as it is, the gut is actually where all of this is happening. And Hippocrates said it best 2,500 years ago that all disease begins in the gut. And the guy was right. It's so true. <laughs> With regard to, I mean, dementia prevention, obviously keto is, is of particular relevance, right? To true. people con concerned about brain health. Is there anything that you discovered while writing Unlocking the Keto Code that um, 
that that perhaps surprised you or that that reaffirmed existing beliefs that you had about diet and its relation to Alzheimer's disease and, and other forms of dementia? Well, I think it's multifactorial. I think Dr. Bredesen and I agree that um, amyloid uh, actually comes from the gut. Uh, it's uh, it starts by coming out of the gut. It's formed in the, by the microbiome and it leaks through leaky gut. And that is actually where amyloid comes from in the first place. But in answer to your question about where do ketones fit in all this, we know that uh, mitochondrial flexibility in neurons is critical mm -hmm. for neurons to function properly. And getting our neurons back to a state where they can actually use ketones as a fuel is critical for several reasons. It turns out that ketones uncouple neuron mitochondria and it generates heat. And it turns out uh, well, something that really surprised me, neurons love high temperatures. They operate at a much higher temperature than normal. And so if you generate heat around neurons, they're actually going to do much better. And I think that explains some of the PET scans showing that MCT oil and ketosis actually improves the activity on a PET scan in the brain. And people have said, see, that means the neurons are using this as a preferential fuel. No, what that means is there's more burning of calories in, by neurons and they're generating heat. And we're picking up that increased metabolic activity, not from the fact that they're burning ketones as a preferred fuel, but they're actually generating heat that we pick up you know, on the PET scans as increased uh, activity of burning calories. So the other thing I think is fascinating that I go into, and we obviously, as you know, we cut lots of things that all of us would have wanted to keep in the book. But it's interesting that CO2 is actually very important for neuron health. And I notice you're having sparkling water and I drink San Pellegrino and you have another one, which is also very good. But it turns out the CO2 from carbonated beverages, actually CO2 has a direct effect on uh, improving neuron function in our brain. So, wow, what a, want another good reason to have, you know, some sparkling water with the addition of some apple cider vinegar or balsamic vinegar. It's a one-two punch. But isn't CO2 a waste product? I mean, we, ex we exhale it, right? Yeah, but it turns out raising our CO2, learning how to conscious breathing is actually the secret of Buddhists and Wim Hof. That when they raise their CO2, they uncouple their mitochondria and that uncoupling generates heat. That's why a Buddhist monk can dry a sopping wet towel or it could melt snow just by meditating because he's actually raising his CO2, which is uncoupling his mitochondria. So all these great breath holding techniques actually come down to just one thing, and that's uncoupling mitochondria. And as I say in the book, uh, the more you uncouple your mitochondria by all these different techniques, the longer you're going to live and the longer you're going to live well. And that's what you and I want, I think. Absolutely. So how much MCT oil are you chugging on a day-to-day -day basis? So uh, what I try to get people to do uh, is get about three tablespoons of, of MCT oil into their diet. And you got to start slow for, for women. Uh, women, MCT oil can cause nausea. It can cause loose bowels and even diarrhea. So you got to start with maybe a teaspoon. Women in my practice do much better with powdered MCT, uh, MCT powders than they do with oils. And the good news is there's plenty of MCT powders on the market now. They're easy to find and they're easy to mix into coffee, for instance. And they actually, there are many coffee creamers that use MCT. Uh, so that's easy to do. If we're really trying to get people to tolerate the time period where they'll 
begin to release free fatty acids from their fat. You may need MCT oil multiple times a day or, or MCT powders. Personally, um, I have my own powder, MCT Wellness from Gundry MD, which has five grams of MCT, uh, which I have every morning. Uh, I also take MCT oil about three times a day. Um, and again, why wouldn't I? Because it, we know that just the very eating of MCT oil, drinking of MCT, will actually cause weight loss by uncoupling mitochondria. So why not? And you get all those all those beneficial signaling. That's what you do. Benefits. You want, you want ketone signaling, and there's so many other ways to get the same signaling ability of ketones, and that's unlocking the keto code. Once you understand what ketones are really doing, then there's lots of ways to duplicate the effect of ketones, and so it becomes additive. Love it. Well, your new book, Unlocking the Keto Code, is packed with details. And uh, God, there's so many other questions that I want to ask you. What? Okay, before we go, what is, uh, what's your take? Because this is sort of a hot button topic these days in, in nutrition spheres. Your take on polyunsaturated fatty acids. Well, I know a lot of my friends and colleagues want to throw polyunsaturated fats under the bus. And not so fast, as I talk about in the book. We have to realize that. Uh, Polyunsaturated fats like linoleic acid and linolenic acid, the omega, short chain omega 6 and short chain omega 3, uh, respectively, are essential fatty acids. Now, the word essential means we absolutely positively have to have them in our diet because we do not manufacture them. And they're essential because they are major components of not only cell membranes, but more importantly, the mitochondrial membranes and the inner mitochondrial membranes. So we have to have them in our diet. But is the excessive amount of particularly linoleic acid uh, the problem? Well, there's some really good work that I show in the book that they've been guilty by association with their combination with the sugars in our diet, particularly high fructose corn syrup. And if you take away the sugar, it turns out that these guys aren't damaging at all. They are, in fact, essential. And I think one of the best studies that has ever been done that doesn't get the love it deserves is the Leon heart diet. Some people call it the lion heart diet. And in the Leon, it was done in Leon, France. And they took people with known heart disease who had had a heart attack, and they randomized them to a Mediterranean diet with additional alpha-linolenic acid, ALA, a large amount of it that they basically got from canola oil, in that case, rapeseed oil, or the American Heart Association low-fat diet. And it was supposed to run for six years. The study was stopped after three years, because the group getting the ALA had such met better results that it was unethical to continue the study. So that, and the, these folks were followed for the additional five years. But what's fascinating is people wanted to know, well, what was the factor in this diet that made the difference? Was it the Mediterranean diet? What was it? only factor after controlling for every other factor that you could control for was the amount of alpha linolenic acid in the bloodstream of the participants that made the difference. So then you go, wow, this is an essential fatty acid. It's in flaxseed oil. It's in organic canola oil. It's in rapeseed oil. What's the deal? Why is it working? Turns out it's an amazing mitochondrial uncoupler. So unbeknownst to anybody, this essential fatty acid was one of the key factors that made this work. So let's not throw these guys under the bus. They are guilty by guilt by association. Let's throw sugar under the bus where it belongs. But let's not think too unkindly of essential fats. Of course not. Now, do you think that these effects were due to the fact that alpha-linoleic acid is an omega-3 fatty acid? 
Yeah, but remember, we have a horrible system for converting long chain omega-3 fats into, I mean, short chain omega-3 fats into long chain fats. And I take care of a, a large number of vegans and vegetarians, and they have just horrible omega-3 indexes, which look at two months of DHA and EPA in your bloodstream. And um, they're eating huge, they're having huge amounts of flaxseed oil um, with no effect. Uh, we, we're not a fish, unfortunately. Uh, so no, it was actually the effect. It is a short chain omega-3 fat, but we have to have short chain omega-3 fats and we have to have short chain omega-6 fats. They're essential. And recently, and I talk about this in the book, there's a new essential fatty acid, which we don't have time to talk about. It's called C15. And it is an odd chain fat found primarily in dairy products that has now been identified as an essential fatty acid that nobody knew about. And it may explain why... In the Framingham Heart Study, which is the longest ongoing heart study now, I think it's in the third or fourth generation of families. One of the fascinating things is that several fats in dairy products, including C15, were identified as one of the most important factors predicting long-term heart health. Dairy fats, for <laughs> God's sake. Uh, boy, have we come full circle. I'm actually very uh, in favor of dairy fat, especially especially lately these days. After all the yep, goat, uh, the, and, she goat and sheep, goat and sheep, folks, and you'll see why. Because believe it or not, thirty percent of the fats in goat and sheep uh, milk are MCTs. Fascinating. You cool. also get a, a nice hit of vitamin K two, metaquinones, yes, which are yes, yes, you do. Vitamin K two is really important, and but, you get some C fifteen and C seventeen in these dairy fats. Hey, if you like that video, you need to check out this one here and I'll see you there. After we get fed first, okay, that leftover stuff that our human cells don't absorb goes to feed the bacteria. 